Um, just a question. Uh, you said that we have a competition and uh, consider the situation the countries have to have a uh, lot tax and we have also uh, to finance the uh, development of high tech and to use uh, subside and also uh, you have mentioned uh, that uh, you we have to finance these things. The question is, once that we have uh, so many expenses from the government, uh, where the money comes from? Once that you have to keep the tax law and we have to subside the high tech, where the money comes from? To the budget. So, para os demais, quem quiser formular as questões em português, pode, porque existe tradução. I think you, if I understand your question, um, you are asking from a taxation perspective, um, how will you, how, where will the revenue come from in order to pursue developmental projects? Ah, uh, yes. Well, uh, it isn't always about it isn't always about finance. Um, developmental projects take very many forms. It can be about creating public-private partnerships. It can be about create a coordinating standards. Uh, it can be about um, um, providing infrastructure and services. It's not just about having billions of dollars in order to uh, fund R&D. Obviously, it's a very important aspect um, to, to sort of move up the technology profile. But uh, I imagine that where there's a will, there's a way, because you can have these cost-shared partnerships, which are very popular now in many of these uh, countries. And, and also, I think, in Taiwan has, uh, has, an, has a has a, uh, a model of payback after having funded these innovations, then there's a sort of repayment period. So I think there are all sorts of interesting ways you can get around the issue of uh, revenue. Yeah. Okay. Não, só para complementar a pergunta dele, porque eu acho que o que ele quis perguntar é se tem diferenças nos padrões de cobrança de impostos nos países que praticam política industrial e que continuam tendo estados ativos, apesar da, do, enfim, da, dos paradigmas neoliberais. E, que, e como esses padrões de cobrança de impostos, por exemplo, em relação ao PIB, em relação ao orçamento, podem, afetam as diferentes políticas industriais e de inovação que são praticadas. understand? I'm not sure that I do. Now, what I said is that uh, how different part, patterns of taxation can influence the way in which, uh, you know... Sorry, I'm, <laughs> sorry, I'm listening to the wrong What I was asking is, like, I was complementing his question, and mm. I was asking how different patterns of taxation mm. uh, 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 can translate in different ways of, an act, of, of acting of an activist state, you know. Because one of the things that's very widely said is that you have too low taxes, you know. And that's the question. In Brazil, for instance, everyone said you have too low taxes. Mm. You have very high taxes for a country like Brazil. Mexico, for instance, has very low taxes. A very low taxation, and I would like to know how the developed countries behave in what concerns taxes and how they finance this activist state in different ways. I think uh, the point would be that, I mean, apart from the U.S., which uh, really has a model of military developmentalism and spends an enormous amount through the, through the military budget on its uh, R&D. Um, more generally, I don't think the, the budgets for um, 
the, you know, the European budget of 91 billion and the, and the various other national budgets are really very large um, relative to their GDP, but they're targeted, they, they're more tar possibly they're spending less in uh, R&D, on the R&D uh, budget than in the past, but the resources seem to be much more targeted, more selective, rather than going scattergun fashion across the board and in that sense they're quite strategic. So I don't think the, the, the taxation aspect is really the issue here. Mm. Uh, you mentioned but you did not develop why this fiction of liberal state has been so influential and I would like very much to know more about it. Why it's been so influential? Well, I think it's been influential because we have a very lopsided um, literature. We have a very lopsided um, debate in which the constraints of globalization have been um, again and again publicized over and over and over again, but not very well understood and certainly not well established, as I made the point earlier particularly with regard to you know, the impact on, ec on macroeconomic and fiscal policy. So while we get a lot of repetition of this idea that globalization is a constraining dynamic, um, we don't get much on the other side of the coin about globalization's enabling logic. We don't have many uh, analyses that go into that in a very detailed way to help us understand more about how, that, how globalization actually valorizes the state. And we need much more research and uh, discussion of that. But then that also begs the question of why do we have that lopsidedness? And that's where I, I think we have to actually go into this sort of, well, the paradigm that we work with is really a society-centered paradigm. It kicks the state out or it, reduces, it, 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 it problematizes the state as venal or weak or corrupt or incompetent or susceptible to society-centered interests and incapable of uh, somehow fending off the uh, major power actors in the economy and society. So we have that kind of idea of the state so that whenever something works, we don't have that idea of, 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 the, of the market or, or economic actors even though we can see all around us today examples of you know, failure and incompetence and so on. But we work with that within that paradigm. And so the, then the, the, the question is, where does that paradigm come from? And that's not my field, but looking at, those who, looking at the work of uh, the studies of people who've looked into that question, Theda Sc uh, Scotchpole uh, famously did so 22 to more than two decades ago, um, asking why was it that the uh, economic role of the state had been expand, you know, that, as a catalyst for, as the role of the state as a catalyst for economic development had been expunged from the social sciences, among other things that she looked at there. Um, she didn't really give us a convincing explanation for why, although she certainly um, uh, put it on her agenda to bring the state back in. But more recent work in that, in that fashion, in that vein, does, I think, give us a plausible story in going right back to the Cold, the Cold War origins and, how, and looking at, at the nature of social science treatments, e economics, political science, and so on, and looking at how the state was actually quite prominent as an actor prior to World War II. And then after, it drops out of the picture and you get this idea of the weak state is the good state, is the free market sort of version. Um, whereas because of the, uh, uh, the association of strong states with totalitarianism, with fascism, with, uh, with Nazism, uh, you know, it was in a, in a bad neighborhood and, and, and got a bad press. And so it was quickly dropped I'm exaggerating a little bit, but pretty much, you know, disappeared from social science treatments, the whole idea of an autonomous state that could actually um, command the levers of the economy and so on. My name is Glauco, I'm from the University of São Paulo. It's a pleasure to be here with you, listening. Are you listening? 
prazer estar aqui ouvindo as suas, suas colocações, ao lado do ministro Reis Veloso. É, minha questão é a seguinte, eu, eu acredito que a maneira como você aborda a questão do Estado é extremamente útil, é, particularmente para a gente entender e acompanhar uma mistificação muito grande que foi feita nos últimos anos a respeito do lugar do Estado. Você enfatiza isso nas suas análises e eu acredito que isso é de extrema, tem um valor muito grande para quem exatamente está procurando encontrar esse novo posicionamento do Estado e poder perceber que, na verdade, muitas das suas características, na verdade, não, não foram embora, elas estavam lá presentes e elas se expressam de uma maneira um pouco diferenciada. Mas, ao mesmo tempo, Uh, se a sua abordagem é útil, uh, eu acredito que ela é extremamente descritiva. Uh, talvez ela seja útil por isso. Uh, e eu sinto um pouco de falta de uh, uma certa arquitetura mais teórica para a gente entender o que está acontecendo. Uh, no caso brasileiro, as suas análises ajudam a perceber que não há uma volta, um retorno apenas do Estado, agora, em anos mais recentes, 2002 para cá, isso é muito anunciado, não é certo isso, que há posições diferenciadas, dependendo das áreas, dos setores, das dimensões. É, na área de crédito, por exemplo, o Brasil teve um ativismo muito forte, o governo teve, o Estado brasileiro, muito intenso, que marcou a economia. Mas se a gente for olhar na área do Banco Central brasileiro, por exemplo, é, nós, temos, nós nunca tivemos uma autonomia e uma visão mais pró-mercado do que a gente poderia imaginar em outras épocas. Acho que é uma combinação e acho que é um painel é, diversificado para a gente entender a atuação do Estado. É, o problema fica complicado, é, e essa é a pergunta que eu queria fazer para você, é, o Estado que nós temos hoje, no caso brasileiro, não é só aqui, tem vários outros lugares, não vou me estender, ele é diferente do que nós tínhamos nos anos 90. Então, o Estado, nos anos 90, aqui no Brasil, ele também não, não havia se retirado, é certo, mas ele é diferente do que nós temos hoje. Então, exatamente essas distinções é que é, exigem da gente uma reflexão maior. Caso contrário, a descrição do processo não consegue perceber que, apesar do Estado não ter se retirado, ele não é o mesmo. Então, eu, faço, eu coloco essa pergunta para você, o que está faltando do ponto de vista uh, mais teórico? Talvez desenvolver dessa ideia de polimorfismo que você anunciou no final e não teve tempo uh, de trabalhar. Desculpe se eu fui longo. Uh, well, yes, the state that you see today is different from the state in the... Nine, in the 1980s, 1970s. I think you could make that point for virtually. I think you could make the point about um, change, and I'm not sure if you're sort of buying into the state transformation thesis, um, the transformationalist argument. But if if it's a point about simple change, well, I, 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 th I think that that's a, a general point that you could make um, in any historical period um, from, say, you know, after the end of World War II, you could say, well, this, the state that grew out of that process was different from the pre-war state. And then by the 70s, you know, it was a different state and so on and so forth. But I think the, the, real, the important question is, that gets lost sight of, is can the state achieve its goals? Does the state pursue goals and can it achieve them? If the argument is that the state no longer has goals, then it is truly indeed a different state. I'm not sure that I've quite followed um, the point that you're trying to make, but if it, is, if it is part of the argument that the state is now transformed, I would simply say to state transformationists 
that they need to tell us, they need to actually tell us what the state has transformed into and they need to address the question about pursuit of goals. Can states pursue their goals? That's really all that matters, isn't it? Well, the, the question is, is the question is quite short, actually, but I believe it's not as simple as it is short. Well, Levanta, you claim that... Uh, Levanta. Okay, sorry. You claim that uh, state, state intervention is the norm and that the neoliberal label is a fallacy or at least a misconception. Maybe fallacy is a hard word. Uh, I don't want to question the, these concepts. My question is whether the spreading of one view or another influences the real action of the state and to what extent does it? Could you... Repeat it? Yes, the, I missed the first part. Okay. You claim that state intervention is the norm and that the neoliberal label is a fallacy or at least a misconception because maybe fallacy is a harsh word. But I don't want to question the, the, the two concepts. What I want to question is whether the spreading of one view or another influences the action of the state and to what extent does it influence the action? The spreading of? One view or, or another. Like the spreading of the... the if state, in, state, if state intervention is norm, or, or if the neoliberal state is real, like the spread, the spread of I didn't catch the word. The spread of the spreading of one view or another, like view. the view, the view if the state intervention is the norm, or the other view that the neoliberal state is is real. Uh, you say view. Yeah, view. View. So the question is, the spreading of one view... Or another. Or another. Yeah. To what extent... Whether the, the spreading of one view or another influences the action of the state... And oh, to I what see what you're saying, yes. And to yes. what extent. Yes. Do you get it? Uh-huh. Well, we're talking here about um, ideological constraints. Yes. Uh, indeed, in some places that has been the case, has it not? But then you would need to ask, that's an empirical question really, isn't it? You can't sort of, you know, just answer that by fiat. You really need to know whether sometimes state, uh, state actors are using neoliberalism as a, um, a, an escape clause from uh, doing the sorts of things that they might otherwise do, whether it's a convenient sort of loophole for them or a sort of get out uh, exit strategy. Um, in some cases where, where it, you know, strategizing might be too difficult or might get them in, involved in, in problems that they'd rather not handle, yes, it could be a very convenient uh, escape clause. Um, I, I, I think also that in some cases you do have uh, genuine ideological uh, commitment to this, this idea, and, uh, but, but not, um, not, not in a permanent way, not in a permanent or consistent way, when it suits. Um, in, in the case of New Zealand, um, the experiment did not last too long. Uh, so whether you could say that was ideological commitment or fervor or whether it was just a sort of uh, episodic um, event, is, it's hard to say. Wait. Um, Linda, I agree with your main point that um, states over the past several decades have been a lot more active and secondly that their activism has been uh, often more positive than has been widely uh, presented in a large body of literature called the globalization consensus or the neoliberal consensus. I agree with that point, but um, the, 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 uh, another way to rephrase the argument that you are arguing against is that it is a convergence argument. It is an argument that all states are converging towards a neoliberal state because 
because of globalization. You are arguing against that, but it seems to me that you are also arguing for a convergence uh, process, but it's convergence in the opposite direction. It's convergence, you're saying that states are converging towards a more active state of the kind that you describe. Well, I worry about your assumption of a convergence process because if I look at the US and Britain and Ireland and Iceland on the one hand and I look at Germany and Sweden uh, on the other and if I look at Spain and Italy and Brazil at certain times to take up your point and Taiwan and Korea I see three main categories of states amongst the high-income states and the middle-income states. So I see a process not of convergence, but rather of differentiation in three fairly stable types. Um, and uh, in the, these three types, there is a different relationship in the three between the state, the corporate sector, and trade unions. Uh, they interact in according to a different logic in the three cases. It seems to me that this difference in the logic of interaction is, can be fairly persistent, though in the case of Brazil, it has changed radically over time. But the question then is simply, how do you relate to this more complicated notion of a differentiation into at least three fairly stable types rather than your argument about convergence towards a single kind of activist state in contrast to the neoliberal state. Uh, just uh, to enable her to answer, I'd like to ask. Where do you put the case of China in these three types of states that you mentioned? Um, <laughs> that's, the next, that's the next question. Um, I, I did say three types within the high income and the middle income world, and fortunately, for today's event. China is not yet in the uh, middle income world. It's still in the low income world, so I don't have to answer the question. <laughs> but uh, more seriously, I agree that it is a very interesting and important question in terms of state theory, um, but I do not have an immediate answer. Um, uh, we can talk about it over dinner. <laughs> Please. Yes, I think it's an intriguing idea that um, to talk about state activism and, and turn on its head the argument that, uh, you know, we're, we're moving towards a sort of neoliberal convergence, that, that I'm proposing a convergence argument. Um, I am and I'm not, you know, I'm not obviously uh, foolish enough to to see a, a, a converging trend um, whereby state traditions are somehow swept aside. After all, you know, I, having done quite a lot of uh, worked worked within an institutional framework from time to time, uh, I'd have to be sensitive to those different traditions and path dependencies. Um, but uh, within those broad rubrics, you can certainly fit in quite a lot of activism, can't you, Robert? <laughs> if you take financial regulation, you have emphasized this general tendency to uh, tighter financial regulation, including in the states uh, known as neoliberal states, such as the US and Britain. Well. Um, that is true. There have been moves to tighten regulation in those two states. But what is striking is how feeble 
how weak those efforts were compared to, say, in Germany, compared to in Spain, compared to in Taiwan. Uh, mm. For example, the British Financial Services Authority, it was set up with a great fanfare of publicity to be a strong single regulator to make London a very safe financial center. That was the discourse, that was the publicity. But the, act, the reality was it was set up to fail. It was set up to do almost nothing. And you see this in the case of Northern Rock, which was the first failure of a British bank in 300 years. It happened in September 2007. And it turns out that in, although Northern Rock was a very big mortgage lender, lending 20% of British mortgages, 20%, um, on what anybody looking at it from the outside would say was a very risky business model. Nevertheless, the Financial Services Authority in 2005 had no contact, no contact with Northern Rock. In 2006, it had one contact with Northern Rock. And in 2007, when Northern Rock went bankrupt, it had seven contacts with Northern Rock, five of which were in one day. Five of which in one day, just before the collapse. In other words, the Financial Services Authority was not doing what it was set up to do. And this reflects the continuing um, strength in Britain of these neoliberal ideas that financial markets regulate themselves. That was not the case in Germany, it was not the case in Spain, not the case in Taiwan, not the case in South Korea. Yeah, so I completely agree with you, Robert. Difference. We're not arguing uh, at odds here. Um, in fact, I never at any point, as far as I'm aware, uh, made, I, ne I didn't make the point that um, financial regulations had been tightened. No, definitely not. I don't know where you got that idea. Um, I talked about financial activism, but I didn't say that the, the rules had been tightened over time. Um, so your rejoinder is not, doesn't really, it doesn't really, it's not really relevant to my argument, uh, and I agree with it. And indeed, Stephen Vogel, in his earlier book, 10 years ago, said it all. Freer markets, more rules. The British uh, deregulatory uh, push uh, was very different from the Japanese deregulatory push. When the Japanese deregulated their financial system and had the big bang, they said, hmm, we are going to stay in charge, we bureaucrats. We will write the rules so that our authority will still matter. And indeed, we don't want um, the Wimbledon effect here, you know, where all the foreigners come and take all the prizes. So, but the, but the British, um, when they wrote, when they deregulated their financial sector, they indeed wrote the rules in such a way to give much more space to so-called, you know, self-regulation, to the, 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 the um, financial sector's the sector itself. And that fits what you've just said. So indeed, there are these path-dependent sort of, uh, you know, institutional frameworks that uh, come into play when we're talking about deregulation, re-regulation, and so on. So I'm, I'm just not quite sure what, um, what, what you're arguing against there. But anyway, we will talk about it later, I'm sure. Bom, quando quando teve início essa discussão, o Glauco Arbix é, manifestou o seu grande apreço pelas suas ideias no que se refere à descrição do que vinha ocorrendo recentemente, etc. E, em particular, nos Estados Unidos. Ele disse que era muito útil, etc. Enquanto descrição, ele enfatizou, em seguida ele disse, ele colocou a segunda parte da intervenção dele, que era 
mas eu sinto falta de um, talvez porque você não teve tempo, de um trabalho teórico é, é, mais robusto. Bom, eu queria assinalar o seguinte, na realidade, o Robert Wade, quando atribui a você uma ideia de convergência no ativismo, ele está, num certo sentido, com a mesma preocupação do Glauco, de buscar universais, de buscar teorias ou buscar generalizações. Eu não creio que você, te, que você tenha falado, que você tenha sugerido a existência de uma tendência ou regra para o ativismo maior e maior. Na realidade, eu entendi, pelo seu paper e tudo, que você convive muito bem com a heterogeneidade. Tanto a heterogeneidade interna ao Estado, ou seja, um país pode ter um banco central extremamente liberal e, uma, e um conjunto de institutos de, de tecnologia extremamente intervencionistas, essa é, é uma coisa, hum. quanto internações, quer dizer, as nações podem, evidentemente, ter a sua é, tendência própria, estar ou, mais ou menos em consonância com outras. Na realidade, ah, sendo certa essa sua posição, e eu confesso a minha total atração por ela, é, na, na realidade, o que o, que o Estado, é, pensar sobre o Estado, volta a ser uma questão de história, em certa medida. A história entra através do Estado. O Estado é uma porta aberta para, o, para, para a história. E vai ser, assim como é impossível teorias singulares da história, eu acho que vai ser impossível teorias singulares de Estado. Enfim, é tudo uma outra... Isso tudo remete... remete a discussões de natureza metodológica, etc. Estado sugere muito mais do que regularidades, tipos, padrões, transformação, categorias bem mais historicizantes do que teorizantes no sentido forte da palavra. Obrigado. Sim, acho que isso realmente capture o que eu estou dizendo, que the polymorphousness of the state is an idea that we lose sight of. And we know that the state is not a unitary configuration. We know that uh, it, it is, it is, a, combi it is a, a structure that has, uh, you know, different parts that have different histories, different constituencies, different interests that have been assembled, crystallized over time. and. Uh, And that reminds us then that when we impose these labels, they might be um, useful for heuristic reasons to help us sort of, you know, carve out little patterns and compare, you know, across, across uh, time and space. But they simplify uh, often. They should come with a warning that, you know, that, that they are just simplistic tools to help us, um, analytical tools, ideal types. Um, and, and, that in, and, and history does enter into this. Um, so a convergence of state types just is, for me, a theoretical impossibility. It's more interesting that to, to actually take a part of a state and see whether that, how that part behaves, how that's developed historically, and, and, and to what other, ca what other cases in, in, uh, in a comparative sense fit, fit that, that, that type. Um, but then you're not talking about the state as such, you're talking about some aspect of it, its developmental aspect or its you know, central bank facet or its, its welfare institutions and so on. 
You can't have a general theory of the state because the state is not a unitary institution. It, unfortunately, um, that's the complexity that we face. É, boa noite a todos. Eu gostaria de agradecer a professora pela exposição. É, a minha pergunta advém de uma colocação de um professor da Universidade de Berkeley, uh, um professor alemão chamado uh, Teubner. Ele analisa a noção do ativismo do Estado não numa perspectiva de polimorfismo estatal ou de mo vários modelos ou estándares de Estado, mas de vários modelos e estándares de ativismo, que eu acho que ficou bem claro com a sua palestra. Interessante trazer a contextualidade do modelo constitucional de, acerca da presença do Estado na economia aqui adotado no Brasil. A nossa Constituição Federal adotou um modelo de uh, valoração da iniciativa privada. A iniciativa privada é um valor da República e, principalmente, é um dos nossos princípios a serem respeitados. De forma que a atuação do Estado se reserva em razões de segurança nacional ou relevante interesse coletivo para que o Estado seja um Estado empresário através de empresas estatais ou não como um Estado empresário, como um Estado regulador no sentido amplo. Então, o, os modelos de ativismo estatal brasileiro é, estão adstritos a essa perspectiva. Num contexto de América Latina, bastante diverso. Então, a senhora acha que, diante dessa perspectiva, é possível se tratar já de um polimorfismo estatal ou a senhora acha que há, de fato, um polimorfismo uh, de... Uh, propriamente de ativismos estatais, ou seja, formas de ações do Estado. Obrigado. Só para esclarecer um ponto. O que a Constituição estabelece no único artigo que permanece do, sobre a ordem econômica e social da Constituição que foi aprovada em 1988, é que o Estado atuará supletivamente ao setor privado, fazendo o que, na área econômica, o que o setor privado não tem condições de fazer. Aliás, este artigo foi copiado da Constituição de 1946, de modo que, por assim dizer, ele define o século XX democrático, de república democrática de direito no Brasil. Ok? Depois é que vem a história que você mencionou. Yes, please. Um, I forgot to put these on, I'm sorry. I'm getting confused. <laughs> Uh, if I can remember um, your points, there were two different issues, and one was uh, that you, you seem to be saying that you were concerned that um, state activism was about interfering with free entrepreneurship or free enterprise. Well, it's not, and I don't know how that idea came across. 
because all of the examples I was uh, giving were from developed democracies, uh, emerging economies, where free enterprise is respected. So it's, it's activism that does not really impinge in any way on you know, the business as usual framework of, of uh, private enterprise, but uses that to assist uh, development. And, and I think the second uh, uh, issue that, you, that came out of what you said was maybe s that I needed to be a little bit clearer about what I mean by polymorphousness. And this is Michael Mann's term uh, to, as, as a way of conceptualizing the fact that we all agree on, that, which is that states are non-unitary. They are a set of institutions that have developed over different points in time. And they have different interests and different constituencies and different goals. And so we, for that reason, we should not think of states as somehow all behaving in a sort of coherent way. We can see that in many, many uh, examples of you know, how the Treasury, treasury the uh, Foreign Affairs Department will have a different view um, of, of uh, the nation's interests than, say, the Ministry of Industry. One will be more outward-oriented, one will be more inward-oriented, and they will of, often ha come, uh, you know, be at odds on, on issues to do with uh, economic development. And that is illustrating, you know, in a descriptive way, again, this theoretical or conceptual idea of the polymorphousness of the state which is quite separate as an issue from whether, w the, when the state is actually involved in the economy, taking an economic role, being active, whether it's pro or against free enterprise. It's quite a different issue. So is that, yeah. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Weiss. Huh? It's a handle esta sessão de abertura, eu gostaria de dizer rapidamente três coisas. One, states do what they deem it necessary to do. Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan perhaps justified their existence. Meaning Those countries and many other countries needed a touch, a sniff of uh, new liberalism. We just have to recall uh, what the unions were doing in England. It was almost a uh, straight jacket for the economy, but a touch was sufficient. Second, my reading of what the states where neoliberalism was more important, like the US and England, what 
day. Ah, saying is particularly as to activist industrial policies. Do what I do, not what I say. Because everybody, particularly the West, every country, particularly the West, always had activist industrial policies. Uh, uh, as Cole Porter would say, the U.S. does it. England does it. European Union does it. Japan does it. Here in Brazil, perhaps, we are to some extent in the 90s, the last innocent on the earth. Three. There is a book and a movie, I always quote movies, called the loneliness of the long distance runner. A solidão do corredor de longa distância. So, two things to point out. Long distance runner and loneliness. Solidão. Uh, I, the experience of development is unique. Every country has to be a long distance runner. And when the country tries to be a long distance runner, she is alone, está sozinho. You cannot transfer one model to another country. But you can learn from other countries' experiences. Their opportunities lost. Their opportunities taken. In the past, in the present. Está encerrada a reunião.